Good morning. I think, I think Steve Buscemi does that scene just awesome. Well, my name is Matt, a lead pastor here at Rooftop. Um, being the best man at a wedding is a very important job. There are plenty of responsibilities. Anybody here ever been a best man? What, what are the responsibilities involved in being a best man? Tell me what that's involved. I've never, I've won, well, once, but it was too long ago. Carrot, okay, protecting the ring, to, the toast, right? What's involved in being a best man? Got to get the groom to the wedding. Pick up the tuxes. Got to sign the document. Got to plan the bachelor party, right? Uh, those are some important responsibilities that seem rather simple, but it's amazing and predictable that plenty of best men flub the job. The website, artofmanliness.com, there is such a website, I go there every day, has a web forum, <laughs> has a web forum on which guys post some of the worst best man mistakes. They include losing the rings, fainting during the ceremony, uh, one recounts vomiting on the bride, one former best man warns future best men, this is something you got to anticipate, that when decorating the getaway car, do not use adhesive that could damage the finish of the vehicle. And then there's the toast. If you want just a few minutes of awkward internet fun, go to Google and type in worst best man toast ever. There's several candidates, but uh, common mistakes during the toast include not practicing the speech, uh, drinking too much before the toast, talking too long, I hate toast, it just go on and on and on, or making rude jokes about the groom's sexual past, always a no-no in the toast. There's all kinds of rules on how to be a best man, but maybe the biggest rule is that it's just not about you. The role of a best man is to serve and support the groom. The worst thing that any attendant can do is distract attention from the couple. Uh, the best man at my wedding, uh, Rob, actually told me later uh, that during the ceremony, he had an itch on his nose, but he refused on principle to itch his nose during the ceremony because it would have taken attention away from Michelle and I. Well, this morning we meet a man in the Bible who is given the responsibility of being the best man at a wedding. This is no ordinary wedding, though, with an ordinary groom and an ordinary bride. It's the wedding of the ages, the wedding between Jesus, the groom, and his bride, the church. And for this extraordinary wedding between this extraordinary couple, they needed an extraordinary best man, someone who could handle all the eternal responsibilities of being the best man at this wedding. So for his best man, Jesus chose a man named John the Baptist. A man who he knew would serve the groom, not distract from the couple, definitely not flub his speech. We've met John the Baptist before, but this morning we get to meet him again in the Gospel of John. For those of you who are just joining us, we're in the middle of our study on the Gospel of John in our series called Savior Among Us. And during this particular section of John, Jesus is out among the people, getting to know them, you, people like you and me, um, but for a few verses, the author of the gospel breaks away from Jesus and tells a story about Jesus' cousin and fellow prophet and the best man at his wedding, a guy named John the Baptist. The story is told in John 3.22. If you want to follow along, you can. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent time, some time with them and baptized now, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. Now, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he's baptizing. And everyone is going to him. To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice, that joy is mine. It is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. 
The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Now this story might deserve some background if you're new to the Bible or you don't remember much about John the Baptist. Uh, He is the man God sent ahead of Jesus to prepare Israel for the Messiah's arrival. He preached in the wilderness, told people to make straight the way of the Lord. John preached some hard sermons, but people generally liked listening to them and they went out to listen to his sermons and then they got baptized by him in the Jordan River. He was so famous that people wondered if he was the Messiah. But he denied it, and when Jesus arrived himself to be baptized, John pointed him out to his disciples. This is the Messiah. This is the man on whom the Spirit rests. This is the man who can give, who came to earth to bring eternal life to his people. But then an interesting and awkward thing happens. Jesus knew he had something better to offer than John did. He had a baptism in the Spirit. Not just a baptism of repentance, which was the type of baptism John was offering. Jesus sort of had a baptism 2.0. So Jesus started assembling his own crew of disciples, even recruiting from among John's gang to market this new baptismal opportunity. They set up their own baptizing operation up the river. It would be like leaving a business and then setting up shop across the street and stealing customers from the business that taught you the trade. There had to be some bad blood. It had to be awkward. I wonder how this signage read. John put out a sign that said, Baptism of repentance, free of charge. Then Jesus and his disciples put out their own sign that said, Baptism of repentance, plus forgiveness, free of charge, plus, by acting now, free gift of Holy Spirit. It reminds me of that internet gag of the dueling church signs in town that I'm sure you've seen before. A Catholic church in a southern town put up a sign reading, all dogs go to heaven. You know how churches do this with, put up goofy messages on signs. Catholic church in this town, all dogs go to heaven. The Presbyterian church in town took offense and responded on its sign that only humans go to heaven, read the Bible. (laughs) The Catholic church retorted that God loves all his creatures, dogs included. To which the Presbyterians responded that dogs don't have souls. This is not open for debate. (laughs) But the Catholics weren't done. They posted that Catholic dogs go to heaven. Presbyterian dogs can talk to their pastor. (laughs) If If you've seen the entire church sign debate, you know that the back and forth actually goes on several more times. If you've researched it at all, you also know that it's fake. (laughs) It was generated by a computer program. (laughs) It's funny, I know, I had to tell you. So it's not hard to imagine that it's real, though, given how we know Christians can struggle to get along, which is what's going on here in John chapter 3. Some of John's disciples get in an argument over the baptizing and whose was better, John's or Jesus. And they come to John and they alert him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. They were jealous that Jesus' operation was starting to take off. In fact, I really love this verse for a couple reasons. It's so revealing. First of all, I love that John's disciples are so jealous and upset about the competition that they can't even speak his name. That man who was baptizing, the one you testified about, he, he, everyone is going out to him. It's like the people of Microsoft talking about the competition. We all know who the competition is. But if you talk about the competition, it seems less formidable. Who's the competition? Don't don't say it. Apple. (laughs) But the other thing I like about this verse is the way John's disciples exaggerate the situation. What do they say? Everyone is going to him. Another translation says everybody is flocking to him. Everyone. Really? Everyone? Everyone? But when you're jealous and insecure, you tend to overstate things a bit. My kids, for example, want a new video game. I can't remember what the name of the video game is. It's something like Blood and Guts 4. (laughs) And you know how many people have Blood and Guts 4? 
everyone has blood and guts for. Everyone in their class, everyone at the school, everyone in the world has this game, but not everyone except them. My kids are the only ones on the planet who don't have blood and guts for. They feel so left out. Like children, John's disciples come to John to alert him to this problem of the unnamed Messiah who is stealing all their customers and baptizing everyone. Thankfully, John is an adult. He is not drawn into the disciples' jealousy. He reminds them of some things they should already know. He reminds them that he is not the Christ, never claimed to be the Christ, and that Jesus, that man, is the Christ. Also, he reminds them that if this were a wedding, let's just say it's a wedding, if this were a wedding... He's only the groomsman. Jesus is the groom. The church is the bride. Heaven is the wedding feast, and he's the best man. His job is to stand there and not scratch his nose. His job is to disappear. And that's what he says. He must become greater, I must become less. Another translation says, he must increase, I must decrease. Most importantly, though, John reminds his disciples that it's not even worth comparing their ministry to Jesus. As he says, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from earth belongs to the earth. I'm only from the earth, John says. I came from the dust. I'm going to return to the dust. He, Jesus, that man, is the one who comes from above and is above all. He, Jesus, that man, is the one God has sent. He, Jesus, that man, is the one who gives eternal life. In other words, John says to his disciples, what are you even doing over here? Why aren't you over there? I'm planning on going over there. After work, I'm going over to the Apple store. What are you even doing over here? So that's the story. Now, I really like the story. I like it because it is like an arrow through my heart. Uh, Maybe you know this, but I'm a jealous, insecure man. I know for a fact that I would have been one of those disciples of John that were jealous of Jesus' success. I very frequently get jealous if Jesus is doing something big and cool that doesn't happen to involve me. I have heard myself say practically the same thing that John's disciples did. Every time a church around here gets big and popular and people start flocking there, my response is as predictable as the tide. That church, that church, don't say its name, please. You know the one. Everyone is going there. Seems like every person I meet is checking it out. Who knows why they're so so successful? Probably lucky. Slick marketing, right place at the right time. You know what's probably happening? They're probably like watering down gospel truths to attract larger crowds. We'll never do that here. In fact, you know what we should do? We should pray for them. (laughs) Pray for these large, growing congregations, these successful congregations. Pray that they, they stop watering down the gospel. I'm exaggerating my response a bit, but not by much. The fact that these are healthy, fast-growing congregations and gifts from God to the world, that's a thought I have to tell myself as a discipline. So I like the story because it confronts my jealousy, but the story is bigger than that. And good news for you, it applies to more than just jealous pastors. The story is a reminder that we all have a tendency to make things about ourselves and not him. That's what John's disciples were doing. They were making things about them, not him. They thought that what they were doing was more important than what Jesus was doing. Jesus had come into the world to bring salvation to humankind, and John's disciples were upset because it made them feel less popular and important. They hadn't learned what John had learned, that Jesus must increase, they must decrease, but it's something we all need to learn. We all have a tendency to make our lives about ourselves, our own happiness, our own satisfaction, our own promotion, our own success. We make our lives about ourselves, which if you think about it, kind of makes sense. I mean, it's our life, right? But that's where we're wrong. I did not invent my life. I do not sustain my life. I don't even understand my life. I certainly can't continue my life. What right really do I have to make my life about myself? 
God is the only one who can give my life meaning. Jesus is the only one who can give my life purpose. Only Jesus can really add any lasting meaning and purpose to my life. We all need to learn John's lesson that the key to eternal life is finding a way to decrease so that Jesus can increase, even if it involves becoming less popular, less successful, and, yea, even less happy. It's like what Paul says to the Galatians later in the New Testament. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. This is rule number one of Christianity, letting Jesus be more central in our lives than even we are. It's how life was meant to work. This is hard work, though. We don't like standing by the groom doing nothing. We don't like giving our lives over to Jesus. They're our lives. We like attention. We like control. We like taking center stage. We want it to be about us. When I was in high school, for example, I remember my first musical. It was uh, Man of La Mancha. Anybody ever seen Man of La Mancha? Uh, when I auditioned, I wanted the role of Don Quixote de La Mancha, the deranged Spanish idealist uh, and the central character. Uh, maybe you know the play, you know. Hear me now, I am that song to dream. The impo- This is where we insert show tunes. But I had never, at this stage in my high school theatrical career, I had never been on stage before, uh, so I really didn't know what I was doing, and I got cast as a muleteer, basically a chorus member. Uh, I had one line, little bird, bring me word. Uh, But the rest was just singing. I still thought I was hot stuff, though, and that the cast was blessed to have me. So I sang too loud, I acted too big, I said my, my one line with way too much passion. <laughs> Little bird, bring me word. I generally hopped around on stage like an idiot. Uh, the guy playing Don Quixote, his name was Brad Rouse. He was actually a phenomenal performer. He went on to Broadway. Uh, but I know that during the musical, he was looking over his shoulder or during the play, wondering what chorus member was behaving like an idiot behind him. And finally, in the middle of the show, I'll never forget this moment, a fellow chorus member, a guy named Gino, came up to me on stage during the show in a voice I'm sure members of the audience could hear. He said, Matt, you're stealing the scene. Calm down. I am not making this up. I did calm down. I was far too embarrassed to do anything other than calm down. And even though it was rather embarrassing, I learned an important lesson that fortnight. I learned that when you're on stage and it's not about you, don't make it about you. If you're the best man, be the best man. If you're a supporting cast member, you're there to support the lead actors who are far more central to the play than you are. And this is true in life and faith, too, because the truth is we're all on stage. Life and faith are a play, but it's not our play. It might be taking place in our lives, but do not be deceived. It's not your play. We're only supporting characters, and the play goes better if we support the lead, Jesus Christ, who is far better of a performer than we will ever be. What am I really talking about, though? I'm talking in metaphors that can be hard to know what to do with weddings, shows. Practically speaking, how can we give Jesus the central role in our lives while we take the supporting role? How can we let Jesus be the groom while we satisfy ourselves with being the best man? How can we decrease so Jesus can increase? The simple and primary answer to this question is just to live for Jesus. Make your life about Jesus. But more practically and specifically, I have a few points to make about letting Jesus increase so we can decrease, we can praise Jesus, we can obey Jesus, and we can trust Jesus. And with the time I have left, that's what I want to talk with you about. First, we can praise Jesus. When John's disciples come to him and tell him about Jesus' success, John responds very quickly, a man can only receive what is given him from heaven. 
He and his disciples had been doing this for a while. They had gotten pretty successful at it. People were coming out to them. It was surely difficult watching all that success roll down the river to Jesus and his operation. Suddenly they were less successful. I imagine John's disciples got a little panicky. What's Jesus doing that we're not doing? What are we doing wrong? What do we need to advertise? How do we need to shake things up a little bit? What new sermon series do we need to do to get more attention? Probably they had started believing that they were behind their own success. We can make the same mistake when things start rolling our way, crediting ourselves with our own success. John, for his part, had the good sense to remember everything they had was given from God, and as God gives them blessings, God can remove them and give them to somebody else. And this is a lesson we forget too. Every blessing we have is from God. We receive nothing that does not come from heaven. As Paul writes later to the Corinthians, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Jobs, children, clothes, family, friends, church, towns, opportunities, apartments, hope, it all comes from above. Why do we pretend that it didn't? This is potentially an incendiary illustration, but I'm going to use it anyway. I'm generally a conservative guy. I don't like the way people depend on the government. You know this about me. That irresponsible 47% that Mr. Romney lambasts. Pull yourself up by our bootstraps. You know, make something of your life. Quit your dependence. That's my philosophy. That's how we did it in the Herndon household. But I tend to forget how dependent I am on the government. I went to college on government scholarships. My mother was a government employee for all practical purposes. So was my dad. My wife goes to school on government loans. I drove here on government roads that I'm not ashamed to say I did not build. I buy subsidized electricity. I buy subsidized gasoline. I buy subsidized food. I thrive on tax breaks. I cannot imagine my life without government aid. But don't tell anybody. Because, you know, I'm a self-made man. I got here through discipline and hard work and my own ingenuity and also lots of government assistance. I forget how dependent I am, but I'm not talking about the government. I'm talking about my dependence on the Lord, which I also tend to forget. Every breath I take is a gift. Every day I wake is a blessing. Every member of my church is a gift from heaven not from shrewd marketing. Every child is God's creation. John's disciples had forgotten this. They had gotten very big in their own eyes when John knew that we should all be very small and thank God for what he gives. If you want to see Jesus increase in your life, you want to see yourself decrease, praise Jesus for what he has given you this morning. Praise Jesus for your blessings, whatever they are. Don't steal the spotlight by withholding praise to the one who gave you everything in your life. Praise Jesus. Also, obey Jesus. Uh, One of the reasons Jesus came to earth was to teach and show us how to live. John says in the passage that the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Jesus, the one God sent, tells us how God wants us to live and behave. Letting Jesus increase in our lives means obeying his words, living life the way he commands. He knows how to live. Jesus lived perfectly. Jesus invented life. He knows how to make it work. But this is exactly where we make life more about us than him. We fool ourselves into thinking we know more about life than he does. Even though life is his creation and he lived perfectly, we think we can improve on his example because, you know, that makes sense. It's like telling Mozart how to write music. It's like telling Billy Graham how to preach. Why don't you think about doing this? It's like telling Chris Carpenter how to pitch. That'd be ridiculous, right? Hey, Carp. It'd be ridiculous. But we do it all the time with Jesus. Jesus, thanks for the instruction, but I got this one. 
I know what you're telling me about how to live life. I know what you're telling me about loving others. I know what you're telling about, tell me about controlling my temper. I know what, what you're telling me about controlling my lust, not being lazy. I know what you say about saving, giving money. I know what you say about staying involved in church and forgiving enemies, but I've got a better idea. Just hear me out. This is another potentially incendiary example. So I offer it carefully, and if you need to talk about it, I'm all game. But back when I was living in Texas, I had a friend who was very unhappy in his marriage. It wasn't abusive, it was just very, very unhappy. And after helping him deal with it for a while, he decided he was just too unhappy and he needed to get a divorce. I told him I understood, I was sorry, I wouldn't judge him, God will always love him. But I also told him I would be a bad friend if I didn't remind you what Jesus says about divorce, which is basically, don't. He said he knew that, but he just couldn't do it anymore, so he got divorced. Afterwards, he said he was happier. Which is kind of my point. Because the sad truth is that his own happiness had become more important than obeying Jesus. Don't get me wrong. God wants us to be happy. But the joy of obeying the Lord's command is far greater than living for our own happiness. This is what John says, the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for the groom and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine. John wasn't happy because things were going well for him. His ministry was declining. He was happy. He was joyful because he heard and obeyed the Lord. You want real lasting joy. Set aside your own happiness. Focus on obeying Jesus. Do what he's given you to do. Serve your families. Love your neighbors. Give away your money. Volunteer your time. There is far greater joy in hearing and obeying Jesus' word than doing what you want. The way to let Jesus increase in our lives is to praise him, to obey him, and lastly, to trust Jesus. Praise him, obey him, and trust him. At the end of the passage, John says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Eternal life is the greatest gift we can imagine. It's life with God and with each other in heaven forever. Life with God and with each other in heaven forever. What's important to note here, though, is how simply John says we can receive this gift. What do you do to receive eternal life? You believe in Jesus. Trust in Jesus might be a better translation. That's so simple. Trust in Jesus, and you can live with God forever and each other in perfect joy in heaven. Again, it's about him. It's not about us. Every other religion I know of makes eternal life a matter of us, not him. Eternal life in Islam is a matter of doing more good works than bad works and tipping the scale in your direction. Eternal life in Judaism is a matter of observing the Torah. Eternal life in Buddhism is achieved through discipline and meditation. Eternal life in Mormonism is being a member in good standing with the church. It's all about us, not him. But in Christianity, it's about Jesus. Jesus lived the perfect life. Jesus died the perfect death. Jesus made the perfect way. Whatever your life looks like, trust and believe in him and you can live forever. This is very good news. Especially for me. Like I've told you, I'm a jealous guy. I grew up dreaming of being successful at something, theater, church, politics, baseball, childbearing, just something. I've learned over life that being successful is harder to come by than you think. And even when you might be successful, there's somebody who's more successful. Even when you're successful, you can feel like such a failure. Even as we're looking for a a new building here to accommodate our massive, unspeakable joy fest crowds. Even as we're looking for a new building so we can keep growing into an ever more successful church, I've wondered what might happen if we never find one. I mean, what if we're stuck here in this starter church forever? What if we never really grow, we never plant any other churches, never become the regional institution 
that we think we can become? What if we never realize our potential? What then? What if that happens? We don't know that it won't. What if Jesus blesses other churches but not ours? What about you? What if you stay stuck at the same place in the life you're at? What if you never find your dream job? What if you never get married and get stuck as a perpetual bridesmaid? What if your business fails? What if you never have the child you've always wanted? What then? That's when we get to trust in Jesus. Every so-called failure allows us to get smaller so Jesus can get bigger. This is painful, necessary, but good. Because the truth is that Jesus is everything we don't need to be in life. He lived the perfect life that God credits to us. He died the perfect death that God gives to us. He was the perfect groom. He was the perfect Don Quixote. He is the perfect pastor. He is the perfect father. He is the perfect Messiah. He is the perfect version of yourself. You don't need to be nothing. You just need to believe that he's everything you don't have to be. Let's pray.